Yes, indeed. Happy St. Stephen's Day. Happy post-Christmas hangover day, or whatever it is <laughs> that you're having yourself. Hope you're all keeping well. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. Prompt to our unscheduled episode, I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Hope you all had a lovely Christmas day and that you're nice and relaxed and full to the brim, maybe enjoying some peace and quiet. And if you're not enjoying some peace and quiet, maybe you've got some screaming kids running around the place, all excited, playing with the toys that Santa left uh, for Christmas. Anyway, I didn't plan to do an episode today, but then it struck me that, well, it being St. Stephen's Day, there are some very important traditions um, that, you know, are best spoken about today. And so it seems only right that we should do that. Anyway, I hope everybody's in good form. Daisy Peters is the most enthusiastic of the YouTubers. As always, fall to Anthony and all of our two, a great and wonderful surprise. I look forward to this episode. I hope we can uh, uh, live up to the billing, uh, Daisy, and I hope you're in good form. Happy Christmas to you. Mandy McCurl says, what a great wee surprise present. A uh, beautiful day with lovely food and wine, followed by an absolute storm raging outside today. How was your Christmas? Well, copy and paste that, Mandy. It is quite stormy here at the moment. But um, all in good form, thankfully, Christmas Day was lovely. A nice relaxing time. Yeah, I actually spent uh, uh, several hours on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day reading. And I don't get a huge amount of time to read these days. But anyway, Archaeoastronomy Database is in the house. Good day to all my friends. I hope you're all well. I'm very grateful for this community. Good stuff. ArchDB, it's great to see you. Thank you for putting together your solstice uh, video of speeding up the solstice beam in Newgrange. That was very interesting. Todd Despero says, hello, Anthony and everyone. Hello, Todd. Stephen Walker says, my day, lol. Hi, everyone. Oh, yes, in Stephen's day. <laughs> hello, Stephen. Emmett Burns says, hi, all. Greetings from Dundalk. It is a shame I have only just found out about these videos. Very glad I have hundreds of hours to catch up on. Yes, indeed, Emmett. I hope that you, <laughs> pardon me, I hope that you greatly enjoy them. Excuse me, the, the uh, turkey and stuffing is uh, repeating on me here. Which is a good complaint, of course. Banakti on Tua, a quote, sorry, Banakti on Tia, a quote from Sigerson Clifford. Hello, John. That's John Main, who is in County Cork. Supra, I hope it's uh, not blow, blowing a gale too strongly down there, John. Sue Prenter says, Evening, Anthony. Such a treat. Hello, Sue. Happy St. Stephen's Day to you. And on Facebook, ArchDB is also on Facebook. Uh, hello, ArchDB again. Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony. Hi, everyone. Hello, Barbara. Jules Cousins is saying hello. Falche. Cy B says, hi, de hi, on Storm Night in Ireland. Yes. What is it? Storm Be Bella, isn't it? Yeah, interesting. Hello, Cy. Janet Moran says, this is a wonderful surprise. Well, I figured, you know, maybe some of you would be at a bit of a loose end. Not everybody has a house packed full of we're lucky as i said to you before there are seven of us and two dogs so there's no isolation here there's no no room to social distance to be honest with you judy mcqueen says hello fault you judy but uh, you know and um, perhaps not everybody's in the same boat and it's nice for us to gather for an extra episode over christmas sandra boothroyd says evening to you hello sandra brady m tussie says hello great sorry good day anthony what a wonderful surprise Glad to provide the surprise. Iris, sorry, Iris Preble says, hello, Falcia, Iris. Catherine Hupp says, hello. Hello, Catherine. Rob, I hope Santa was good. Roberto Rob, Roboiro Diaz says, Nolig Honodic Bonadal from Cambria a Coruña, Galicia. Hello, Roberto. Good evening to you. Barb Jordan says, hi, everyone. Hello, Barb. Um, first ever commenter on an Irish uh, live Irish Mits episode. Stacey Herman Lawrence says, yay, very good to see you, Anthony. And oh, hello, Stacey, welcome along. Cheers from sunny Denver, Colorado, says Catherine Hupp. Merry Christmas time. Happy Christmas to all of you. Denise Van Nostron says, hello from South Carolina, USA. Delighted to see you. Denise, we are delighted likewise to see you. Robert Friend says, fall to Anthony, happy St. Stephen's Day. From a wet and wild Paisley. Yes, wet and wild here in County Louth as well. Kristen Murray Endre says, hi, everyone on this Lovely relaxing day, chilling in chilly even in Chicago, 
but always warm here in the library. Yes, me too. You can probably hear the fan heater going there just to keep the place nice and toasty. Veronica Casey says hi there, Giagic. Veronica Kelly Edmiston is in the house. Happy Boxing Day, as they call it in uh, Britain. Happy Boxing Day, everyone. So tomorrow is my birthday. Oh, I see. So you get sort of Christmas presents and then two days later, birthday presents. That's better than being a Christmas Day baby, you know. Um, my good friend Richard Moore, is uh, his birthday was yesterday on Christmas Day. So there you go. Kelly, happy birthday to you. I hope you have a great day. Kathleen Kane says, well, if no rain tonight, the talk is great. Neil Hughes says, uh, Law, Fela, Stuffon, Anthony and all the two are from Mary and Neil, Coltbridge, Scotland. Hello. I wonder, is the Fionn Jarrog all gone from the Christmas or is there still some left? Valerie Gallagher says hello from sunny, cold Rhode Island. Hello, Valerie. Veronica Casey says, I'm... And we'll get the rest of the sentence in a moment. Doris O'Hara says, hi, Anthony. Wonderful surprise. Hello, Doris. Good evening to you. Mela Gabel says, hello from Florida. Hello. Good evening. Good afternoon to Florida. Uh, Iris says, really appreciate. No problem. Sabrina Spaziani says, hello, Anthony. Merry Christmas to you. A few days ago, we got your beautiful calendar here in Vancouver. Cheers. Brilliant. Delighted to hear that it arrived safe and sound. Margaret Kiernan on Drolin. Happy, happy Stevens Day, Anthony. Thanks, Margaret. Your many happy returns. You're welcome. Desiree Riley says, what a lovely surprise. So very thoughtful of you, Anthony. Hope you and all the two had a wonderful Christmas. Well, do you know what? So far, so good. A really nice Christmas. Yes. And I hope likewise for yourself, Desiree. Al Hubener says hello from Connecticut. I'm reminded of a song, Rain in the Furs by the Chieftains as I see the title of today's programme. Yes, indeed. Uh, Sue Ellen Stock says, Hi from Sue Ellen Stock, West Rocks North. Sorry. Oh, and, and when I see NSW, I go North, South, West. New South Wales, Australia. Hello, Sue, and good morning to you. Kaylee During is in the house. Good evening, Anthony. What a surprise to see you on our second day of Christmas in the Netherlands. Happy holidays to a Slauncha. Yes, indeed, Slauncha, uh, Kaylee, and all. Brian Casey says, just me and the dog, and she's snoring away. I think, um, yeah, I better not tempt fate. Coda is very quiet, but that's probably because he's got a good Christmas feed in him. Uh, Hugo says, hello again from Porto, northern Portugal. There are similar traditions to hunting the rain in Galicia and northern Portugal. Very interesting, Hugo. I did not know that. Anne-Marie Wilson says, hi from, is it... Dorigo, New South Wales. Oh, a couple of new, a couple of Australian viewers in the house. So very good morning to you, Neil Hughes. Only the five bottles of Fian Jarag left, Anthony. <laughs> Erica Rivertree is in the house. Banachti, O Louisville, Kentucky. Nolik Hona Dutch August. Uh, Ort Fane, Erica. Hope you're having a lovely Christmas. Great to see you in the house. Angelica. Fialkaus. Fialkowska says hello from Poland. Hello, Angelica. Welcome along. Christopher Le Lely says bonsoir de Brussels. Bonsoir mon ami. And uh, you're welcome along. Mary Lou Fallon Carty says Folja os Massachusetts. Hello, Mary Lou. Ralph Waldron says very wet and wild in Athlete. No rain, boys. Yeah, well, I think the storm would put a lot of people off. At the moment, it's a bit stormy, all right. Adina Sparks says, hello, Anthony Melba, to a nice surprise. Dolmach McDermott. Yay, hi, all the tour eggs, lols. Bell check. All, to all the tour from Bray. Hello, <laughs> Dolmach. Julie Maudlin says, good evening from, sorry, Maldin. Good evening from California in the USA. Hello, sorry, good afternoon, even. Good afternoon to you, Julie. Welcome along. Candy Peterson says, happy Boxing Day from the great state of Alaska. The last frontier. Hello, Candy. And back on YouTube. Anyone else that we missed? Joan McH. A couple of years ago, we had the Wren Boys come singing at our door. It was lovely. Yeah, it's, the tradition is actually still alive in some places. Stephen McGuire says, hi, happy St. Stephen's Day. Watching from Dublin. Only found out about the Wren Boys today. Hello, Stephen. Welcome along. We're, oh, we're going to fill, fill you in a little bit. Uh, a little bit. I don't know a huge amount about it myself, to be honest. It's not a tradition that I recall in my own lifetime ever being honoured in here in Drogheda. But uh, there are still pockets, more rurally, I would say, of Ireland, where the traditions of St. Stephen's Day are still upheld. 
and Mary Lou Nolikhana did Gorov Mahagut. No problem, Mary. Elaine Dent Lingen Felter is in the house from beautiful sunny Texas. Hope you had a great Christmas. All going well so far. Yes, indeed. Um, right. Uh, Jimmy Ennis says greetings for St. Stephen's Day from Farnborough, Hampshire. Hello, Jimmy. Welcome along, Fault you. Uh, I suppose we better get the joke over and done with. So I. I found out my girlfriend is really a ghost. To be honest with you, I had my suspicions the moment she walked through the door. And straight on with the show, I want to say thanks to the lovely, if you saw the graphic, Regina Riley, happy St. Stephen's Day all and happy new year. Yes, indeed, Regina, happy uh, new year to you too just a reminder that we will actually have one more episode in 2020 and that's monday monday's episode which is now going to be episode 132 which will feature morgan daimler talking about her translation of cop Moitura, the second battle of Moitura. i want to say thanks to evgeny cherkaski from Pixabay for the beautiful picture of the wren. I don't have any nice close-up pictures of wrens. I have seen them out in the fields and the bushes out at Brunibonia over the years and heard them, of course, but I didn't have such a really nice picture. So thank you for that beautiful picture. Also, just to briefly mention, um, because it's sort of St. Stephen's Day uh, and it's almost the end of 2020, and I know a lot of you will be celebrating the end of 2020 i always say don't celebrate too loudly because you don't know what 2021 is going to bring so just be glad for the present moment um uh theresa k drevdal says hello from oregon hello theresa good afternoon to you barbara murphy's in the house always always very glad to welcome another murphy in the house brendan burns says my aunts and uncles did the wren boys every st stephen's day and all monies collected went to charity isn't that brilliant and that is, of course, part of the tradition. I'm just going to paste in a link. Uh, I have a special offer on the website from today until the new year. And that is, if you buy uh, the 2021 calendar and a copy of Cry of the Sebek together, uh, you get 33% off both of them. Uh, so a substantial reduction uh, if you're interested. Uh, there's the link. And the other thing is, as always, just to quickly mention the Mythical Ireland patrons who are uh, very important in terms of supporting the work of Mythical Ireland and all of the podcasts and videos and blog posts and, so, you know, uh, supporting, for instance, the hosting of the website and the IT support and, uh, you know, the little bits of hardware that are used, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you want to become a patron, that's patreon.com forward slash mythical Ireland queer. For your support, you do get something in return, unless your pledge is the minimum one dollar. Um, and thank you for your support. Uh, above that, everyone gets rewards on a monthly basis. And if you go high enough, uh, you actually get uh, merchandise too. Mythical Ireland merchandise. There's a thought. Anyway, straight on with the show. Um, Don Hilton is in the house. Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. Love from Lancashire. Hello, Don. Uh, welcome along. Teresa says, thanks for all you do. Well, I'm very glad to do it. I said that before, didn't I? Oh, it's a great honour and a great privilege for me. And uh, thought, oh, sorry. Mary Lou Fallon Carty says, I did it also as a child growing up in up in Galia, in Galway. La Fela Stefan. St. Stephen's Day. Yes, indeed. Barbara Kling is in Vermont, says hello. Hello, Barbara. Happy Christmas. Happy St. Stephen's Day to you. Tarini Pendleton has joined us also tonight. Going to be reading from the wonderful The Year in Ireland by Kevin Danaher. Irish calendar customs. And uh, almost at the end of the book, actually, is the bit about St. Stephen's Day. And that's where we're going to pick up. Um, but Danaher, uh, uh, this book in particular, is brilliant in terms of all of those celebrations that happened throughout the year, uh, published in 1972 by Mercier, M-E-R-C-I-E-R. -E and I think I was telling you, this is one of those that uh, I, I got a while back and uh, was thoroughly delighted to add it to my collection uh, because I believe it to be very important. Michael Halloran says, hello from, how do you pronounce that? Is it Des Moines? In Iowa, 
or is it Des Moines? I think I think it's Des Moines. Is it? Is that? Um, I don't know, uh, and I'm not going to put my foot in it. But is that sort? Does that have some sort of French origin or something? But uh, you're very welcome, Michael. Good afternoon to you in uh, Des Moines. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, so perhaps if I'm mistaken, that you might tell me. Uh, also to say hello uh, to all those who are who uh, I'm not live streaming on Twitter, but all those uh, Mythical Ireland followers on Twitter. That seems to be the smallest of the uh, uh, the organ organized um, social media efforts with Mythical Ireland. De, de, okay, de, de Moen, is that right? D-E-H-M-O-I-N, is that how I pronounce it? De Moen. Willow Thornhart says, I just joined. What book are you talking about? It's called The Year in Ireland, Irish Calendar Customs by Kevin Danaher. Anne McCallum has joined us. Du Moen. Du Moen. Okay. I do apologise. I actually, I realise that I'm familiar with the place name, but I've never known how to pronounce it. A few different, uh, uh, a, a few different suggestions. Kristen is saying Da Moin. Um, du Moin. Okay. Uh, Anne McCallum says, hello, Anthony and the mighty Tua Da Anton. Just caught this. So glad. Good stuff. Well, pull up a chair, grab yourself a dram or a brew, whatever you fancy yourself. Uh, moin, yes, Michael says. Yeah, moin. I think we have the second part. It's the first part. I'm not entirely sure about. Da moin, like boin. Yes, da moin, da moin, da moin, do moin. A few different suggestions. So I'm I'm really clueless here now. You sir, I think you are sending me off on a spurious track. Laura Puente says happy greetings from Chicago. Hello, Laura. Welcome along. Good afternoon. Neil Hughes says drawda. Yeah, I mean that's it. Drawda. Drada, Des Moines. Ah, okay. So, so less emphasis on the, the, the. Listen to this when you get a chance. Michael says, "Grand, I will do." Yes, I promise to have that learned off for the next episode. Anyway, today it being Saint Stephen's Day, what time are we on? Let's call that seventeen. Just for those viewers who are catching up later on YouTube who don't like listening to all the greetings, just join us live and and get your greeting yourself. Over the greater part of Ireland, ooh, I have to put the spectacles on. I fear that I have indulged in too much Christmas feasting. Over the greater part of Ireland, St. Stephen's Day is still remembered as the day for hunting the wren, although the custom itself has died out in many areas. Matthew Bessel says, Slauncha Yuzol, XO Gay Celts Worldwide. Hello, Matthew and Gay Celts Worldwide. Good evening to you. A wee brandy for me tonight for my birthday. Kelly, you're you're entitled to more than just a wee brandy. You know, you have our permission to indulge, absolutely, it being halfway between Christmas Day and your birthday. Absolutely. Mr. and Mrs. Hall, visiting Cork about 1840, described it thus. For some weeks preceding Christmas, crowds of village boys may be seen peering into the hedges in search of the tiny wren. And when one is discovered, the whole assemble and give eager chase to until they have slain the little bird. This is an aspect, I have to be honest with you, that is a little bit sad in terms of the old custom. Why kill such a beautiful little bird? In the hunt, the utmost excitement prevails, shouting, screeching and rushing. All sorts of missiles are flung at the puny mark and not unfrequently they light upon the head of some less innocent being. From bush to bush, from hedge to hedge, is the wren pursued until bagged with as much pride and pleasure as the cock of the woods by the more ambitious sportsman. The stranger is utterly at a loss to conceive the cause of this hubbub or the motive for so much energy in pursuit of such small gear. On the anniversary of St. Stephen, the 26th of December, the enigma is explained. Attached to a huge holly bush, elevated on a pole, the bodies of several little wrens are borne about. This bush is an object of admiration in proportion to the number of dependent birds and is carried through the streets in procession. 
by a troop of boys, among whom may be usually found children of a larger growth, shouting and roaring as they proceed along, and every now and then stopping before some popular house and there singing the rain song. To the words we have listened a score of times, and although we have found them often varied according to the wit or poetical capabilities of a leader of the party, and have frequently heard them drawled out to an apparently (laughs) interminable length, the following specimen will probably satisfy our readers as to the merit of the composition. The Ran, the Ran, the king of all birds, and that is spelled W-R-A-N, which must have been a colloquial pronunciation in certain parts of Ireland, the Ran instead of the Rain. Indigo asks, why do the wrens have to be killed? Keep listening because eventually they did replace the live wren with a a fake or toy wren. The wren, the wren, the king of all birds. St. Stephen's day was caught in the furs. Although he is little, his family's great. Put your hand in your pocket and give us a treat. T-R-A-T-E, again, a colloquialism for treat. Give us a treat. Sing holly, sing ivy. Sing ivy, sing holly. A drop just to drink it would drown melancholy. And if you draw it of the best, I hope in heaven your soul will rest, (laughs) S-O-W-L. But if you draw, D-H-R-A-W, again, the colloquialisms are being spelled here. But if you draw it of the small, it won't agree with the Ram boys at all. Of course, contributions are levied in many quarters, and the evening is, or rather was, occupied in drinking out the sum total of the day's collection. Patrick Kennedy, writing of Wren Boys in Wexford, Banks of the Borough, uh, whatever publication that is, tells us that in the public esteem, by the way, I should say that if you follow Michael Fortune on um, folklore.ie, Michael uh, had, uh, perhaps some of his kids, his family, were t- participating in, in a, 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 ran, a Wren uh, commemoration or a Wren event today with Mummers as well. So maybe get over to his page when you're finished. Many degrees under the May boys and Mummers were the Wren boys, who in our youth flourished in the eastern portion of the country. No doubt we have seen and been among parties of boys who lost much time on St. Stephen's Day in searching for a little drooleen, D-H-R-U-L-E-E-N, which is an anglicisation of the Irish word for wren, which is drooleen. In searching for a little drooleen wren through the furze bushes, generally without success. But on the solitary occasion when the chase was successful and we had secured the lifeless body of the poor little thing, it was accidentally killed in a holly bush, we only serenaded our own families and Father Murphy's niece. Pardon me. She insisted on treating us to some beer. The most courageous of the party ventured to taste it, but incontinently spluttered it out and took to his heels. None of the others was found hardy enough to try its flavour. But professional artists used by some means to secure a live wren and fastened it by a string to the twig of an ivy or holly bush and enlivened by the strains of an ear piercing fife invade the quiet of strong farmers houses and dance and shout and sing the well known legend beginning. I'm sorry. Crikey. It's all catching up on me now. Those late late night games last night. The ran, the ran, the king of all birds, on St. Stephen's Day was caught in the furs, etc., etc. Then hands were taken and steps performed round the Bushal Nadrulim, who capered away in his best style, shaking the bush and the poor prisoner in unison. They generally succeeded in extracting drink or money, and the day's labours ended with a carouse for detail in the mysteries of which we have no relish. Later in the same century, the ritual in County Kildare was as follows. St. Stephen's Day. This is the day on which the Ran boys go their rounds. So as you can see, in quite a lot of places, it was spelt W-R-A-N instead of W-R-E-N. For a day or two previously, the Wren has been hunted and knocked over with a stick or stone. Two or three of them are tied to a branch, torn from a holly bush, which is decorated with coloured ribbons. On St. Stephen's Day, small parties of young boys carry one of these bushes about the country 
and visit the houses along the road, soliciting coin or eatables. Money or food, basically. At each house they come at each sorry, at each house they come to, they repeat a verse or two of a song which commences. The wren, the wren, the king of all birds, on St. Stephen's Day was caught in the furs. Though his body is small, his family is great. So if you please, Your Honour, give us a trade. On Christmas Day, I turned a spit. I burned my finger. I feel it yet. Up with the kettle and down with the pan. Give us some money to bury the ram. Interesting. I turned a spit and burned my finger. What does that remind us of, turning the spit and burning our finger? I'll let you answer that. The song varies in different localities, but all versions appear disjointed and in no way refer to St. Stephen's Day nor to the object of killing the wren. I apologise. In some cases, I'm trying to fight back the yawning. In some cases, the wren boys carry around little toy birds on a decorated bier, and they themselves have ribbons and coloured pieces of cloth pinned to their clothes. If they receive no welcome at a house and are told to be off out of that, Go on, out, go on out of that. There is a danger of their burying one of the wrens opposite the hall door, through which no look would then enter for a twelve month. Eventually, at the end of the day, each wren is buried with a penny. Uh, correct. Those who are talking about the salmon of knowledge, 100% right. And I wouldn't mind. I went to bed la early last night. Or early in the morning last night. Yes, the salmon of knowledge and the burnt thumb. Absolutely. Congratulations to all of you who are uh, getting that right. Teresina Fitzpatrick is in the house. I don't know when you snuck in, but hello, and I hope you're having a lovely Christmas. It is noted by Helen Rowe in Leash in the 1940s in Belogis, uh, which, which was a, a, a publication of uh, folklore. In all parts of the country, sorry, the county in Leash, the Wren boys go their rounds on St. Stephen's Day. During the past 30 years, this custom has undergone many changes. Ugh. Sorry. Formerly, the bush, usually a holly tree, was decorated with a few rags and the dead body of a wren. It was only carried by boys. And the first group of boys to visit a house bearing the wren bush were considered to bring luck for the coming year. And in consequence, were suitably rewarded. Later comers were not so fortunate. As a result, it was customary to come very early while it was still dark and sing outside the house. After 12 noon, the bushes were thrown away. Nowadays, it is comparatively rare to see a bush with a dead bird, but the other decorations have become much more elaborate, coloured paper, ribbons, tinsel bulbs, silver and coloured streamers, etc. Rowan Grove is in the house all right. In, in Colorado, that's perfectly okay, Rowan. Sit there and enjoy yourself. And a happy Christmas to you and happy St. Stephen's Day. Children of both sexes now go round, as well as grown young men. These lads are usually masked with comic faces and wear a sort of fancy dress and are dressed as women. They bring with them often melodians or mouth organs and render versions of the more popular foxtrots and film songs of the day. Hardly anyone now seems able to remember more than a few lines of the rhyme, which used to be chanted in full. There is no time limit, but they begin much later, about 10 in the morning, and go on until late in the afternoon. The Wren boys also go about in groups by bus from village to village. Yes, I do, I do apologise, uh, Teresina, and anyone else who's reaction yawning. They do say it's contagious, don't they? Hardly anyone now seems able to remember more than a few lines of the rhyme, which used to be chanted in full. There's no time limit, etc. Yes. The Wren boys also go about in groups by bus from village to village. The following represents all of the Wren boys' songs that I can recover. It is recited in a high nasal whine at great speed which renders it almost unintelligible and also helps to disguise the children's ignorance of what they are saying. The ran, the ran, the king of all birds on St. Stephen's Day was caught in the furs. And though he is little, his family is great. So rise up, landlady, and give us a trade. 
Up with the kettle and on with the pan. Mr. So-and-so is a gentleman. We hoosed her up, we hoosed her down. We hoosed her into so-and-so town. We dipped her wing in a barrel of beer. Then rise up, landlady, and give us good cheer. Up with the kettle and on with the pan. Give us an answer and let us be gone. Give us something new, give us something old, be it only silver or copper or gold. It's money we want, it's money we crave. If you don't give us money, we'll bring you to the grave. How thoroughly threatening. <laughs> so up the kettle and under the pan, for Mr. So-and-so is a gentleman. Charlotte Morse Cooper is in the house. So is Sheila Moylan. I always scared, I was always scared of the Wren boys. They wore dresses and Halloween masks in leash. Yes, indeed. We're just talking about Leash there a moment ago. I was just saying earlier on, um, it's not a, it's not a, a custom that was really observed in Drogheda, to my to my memory, except in the northern part of Ulster, from Donegal to Antrim, the Wren Hunt procession was known all over Ireland in more or less the form described in the accounts given above. A group of young people went about in disguise or fancy dress, claiming that they had captured or killed a wren and requesting help to bury it. They sang a verse explaining their quest and also provided other entertainment by dancing, singing and playing music. The money collected was spent on food and drink to be consumed later at a wren party. Some groups of wren boys buried the wren at the end of their rounds and sometimes the wren was buried in front of a house where a contribution had been refused. Traces of what appear to have been a more elaborate ritual are, however, occasionally to be found. Generally in Munster, where the custom survives mo most, st most strongly, that's uh, the south of the country, the boys are headed by a captain who is dressed in quasi-military style and carries a sword. Two other characters frequently included were the Amadon, or the jester, who carried a bladder on a stick, and the Oinshuch, or the female jester, a boy disguised in woman's, women's clothes. This pair kept the onlookers amused by quips, pranks and buffoonery, while the other boys sang and danced to entertain. Catherine Cooney is in the house from central New York and says Merry Christmas to everybody. Yes, indeed, Merry Christmas to you, Catherine. A note in the graphic in January 1894 with, with the Wren boys at Dingle reads, the Wren boys, having killed a Wren, tie it to a holly bush on a pole. Two of them decorate their heads and shoulders with straw and wear masks with single eye holes. They also carry large bladders tied to sticks with which to clear the way. Two others also masked dress it, dress dress in petticoats and are supposed to represent dancers. Six more carry flags, while one plays a fife and another a drum. Part of the Dingle ceremony appears to have been a mock battle between a group with wooden swords and another group armed with bladders on sticks. Name, named individual characters among the combatants, such as Sir Sop and Sean Scott, seem to indicate even more elaborate ritual formerly. Around Tralee and in the Dingle Peninsula, the Wren boys usually had a lawyer, a lawyer Vaughan, a white mare, a hobby horse, made with a wooden frame covered by a white sheet. This had a carved wooden horse head and dangling legs. Matthew wants to know how do you spell the female mock jester? It's spelled O Father I N S E A C H. Oinshach. O Father I N S E A C H. Hope that helps. The boy who bore it on his shoulders, that's the Lower Vaughan or the, uh, the White Mare, could, by means of strings, make the jaws snap and the hind legs kick up. And persons who crowded too closely or who did not instantly contribute were menaced by teeth and hooves. Brendan is suggesting maybe the Wren boys were only common beyond the pale. And yet they're suggesting here, Brendan, it was more commonplace in the East than in the West. So who knows? Yeah, maybe it's an older uh, Irish custom. The verses sung are recited, but I think there'll be contradictory evidence shortly about that. The verses sung are recited by the Wren boys very considerably from place to place. 
and often these are confused with those of the Mummers and with other Chris Christmas rhymes. Patrick Kennedy's reference to the low esteem in which the custom was held in Wexford is borne out in other places. Olive O'Sullivan marked in Callum in 1828. The rabble of the town going from door to door with a wren in a holly bush asking for money in order to be drunk late this evening. It is a bad custom to give it to them money. Uh, so uh, he appears to be suggesting uh, that uh, they were only literally co collecting drink money and that was the height of it. Uh, Patricia McAteer says, I remember one, good evening Patricia, I didn't even realise you were there, hello and happy St Stephen's Day. I remember one Christmas spent on Inish Boffin, the local Wren boys came visiting, brilliant stuff. In Cork in 1845, the mayor, Richard Dowden, forbade the hunting of the little bird on St Stephen's Day by all the idle fellows of the country. In many places, the proceedings were rowdy and sometimes the boys were drunk before the end of the day. Surprise, surprise. Sometimes two rival groups of Wren boys met and fought, especially when one group invaded the territory of another. Sounds very clannish. Yes, indeed. We didn't have any of that going on in Ireland in former times. On the other hand, or maybe it's just uh, inter-county GAA rivalry. On the other hand, in those areas where the custom still flourishes, it is usually conducted with decorum. And the visits of the Wren boys are met with at least good-humoured tolerance. In places, the failure of the boys to visit a house would be taken as an insult to the occupants. However, a household of which a member has died during the year is not visited. Veronica says, my granny from Connemara would get the whole family to dress up masks. One boy would dress as a girl and they do tricks and songs, games, etc. Brilliant stuff. Usually in the southwest of Ireland, the proceeds of the collection made in their rounds by the larger groups are spent some days later in providing food and drink to be consumed at a rain party to which a large number of guests may be invited. A very widespread custom in Ireland was the observing of St. Stephen's Day as a fast day. This was said to ensure good health during the coming year, although cynics held that abstention from food on this day was a natural consequence of overeating on, Saint Chris on Christmas Day. In many places, St. Stephen's Day was given over to outdoor sports such as horse racing, beagling, coursing and fowling, while in former times, cockfighting and bull baiting were favoured pastimes in parts of Ulster and Leinster. And I will talk momentarily about mummers, but there's two things that I must talk about before they go out of my head. Arable na lorach bonye, which is the tail or trail of the white mare is an old Irish name for the Milky Way. And I'm always interested when I see Lor Vaughan, uh, the white mare, because it sort of harks back to much more ancient rituals. For instance, the ritual mating of he who would be king uh, with, a, with a white mare before said mare uh, was ritually slaughtered, chopped up into pieces, and those pieces placed in a large vat or bath and the king, uh, stripping naked, had to step into said bath or vat uh, and drink the blooded water and eat the horse flesh, and only then would be pronounced king. That is, of course, according to Geraldus Cambrensis, Gerald of Wales, who was a 12th century or 13th century, 12th century uh, Welsh, one could say, propagandist. Uh, uh, and there are differences of, of opinion about uh, the uh, veracity of his accounts. Uh, that ritual was said to come from the far north north of the country. But I am interested in the whole idea of the Milky Way being the remnants of a white mare. I think that's just fascinating. I wrote about that in Mythical, Ar Mythical Ireland. Um, there's a chapter about uh, the old names of the Milky Way. And there are actually several of them, I think seven in total, including the one that we know the most, um, which is Balach na Bo Finna, the way of the white cow. And again, the white cow, if you think about it, Bowen, uh, well, you see, she kind of left a trail, as it were, because she was the white cow goddess who was dismembered and disfigured at the well of Segish or the well of Necton and washed down by the Boyn uh, as it flowed down to the sea. Yeah, I'm uh, just going to have a look for this. Arable Nalorach Bonya, the tale of the white mare. 
the Laura Vaughan, the White Mirror, is considered by some to be an ancient sovereignty goddess. This is why I'm interested in the possibility that some of those customs, which are detailed in the 19th and 20th centuries around Ireland, uh, to do with the Ram and the Mummers and the Laura Vaughan, etc., uh, may have much more ancient origins. Fascinatingly, Ronald Hicks says that in Irish tradition, the moon was referred to as on Laura Vaughan, the white mare. So there you go. This idea is similar in some respects to the idea of the moon as a white cow, Bo Finna. Uh, one old Samhain custom in Ireland involved the procession of the Laura Vaughan, the white mare, from house to house. And we see that that was also a custom in some places uh, on St. Stephen's Day as well. People would blow on cow's horns and the party was headed by a person dressed in a white robe or sheet who was known as the white mare. There is a place in Scotland called Lorach na Ba Banya, which means the place of the white cow. The story with this, the story associated with this place, says that it was the spot where the cow first lay down to rest. There is a famous, or rather infamous, account of a bizarre inauguration ritual involving a white mare, in which the Cainéal Conal, a, a northern sept of the Ainéal dynasty in Donegal, participated. The account was given by a 12th century Welsh scholar, Geraldus Cambrensis, whose writings about Ireland have been described as a hatchet job. Nonetheless, the ritual has echoes in the Hindu Asvameda horse sacrifice and is worth recounting in summarised form. The one to be inaugurated embraces a white mare, quote, professing himself to be a beast also, unquote. The mare is killed, chopped into pieces and boiled in water. A bath is then made from the same water and the man sits in this bath, surrounded by all his people. Together, they eat the meat of the white mare that has been killed. The man drinks from the water of the bloody bath in which he is immersed uh, by dipping his mouth into the water. <laughs> when this unrighteous rite has been carried out, his kingship and dominion has been conferred. There you go. Can't always believe old Gerald. Absolutely right, Rowan. Could the white mares be connected to the white horse's land art? Asks Don. There is a possibility. Yeah, who can say? But I mean, fascinating, you know. And then we go on to the mummers. That does not sound sanitary, says Desiree. You're quite, you're quite right about that. Neil Hughes says it's a nightmare. <laughs> You can take over telling the jokes from next week, Neil. <laughs> God knows they must be better than mine. Um, a visitor to Cork in 1685 reported as follows. Last evening there was presented the drollest piece of mummery I ever saw in or out of Ireland. There was St. George and St. Dennis and St. Patrick in their buff coats. And the Turk was there likewise and Oliver Cromwell and a doctor and an old woman who made rare sport till Belzebub be B-E-L-S-I-B-U-B, -E <laughs> presumably Beelzebub, came in with a frying pan upon his shoulder and a great flail in his hand, thrashing about him on friends and foes, and at last running away with the bold usurper Cromwell, whom he tweaked by his gilded nose, and there came a little devil with a broom to gather up the money that was thrown to the mummers for the sport. It is an ancient pastime, they tell me, of the citizens. In more recent times, over the past 150 years or so, similar plays were performed by local boys in many parts of Ireland. Tina Overbury joins us. So lovely to follow you. I'm all the way on the west coast of Canada on Bowen Island. Good evening. Good afternoon. Is it still morning time there? It's just about the middle of the day, I presume. Tina, you're very welcome. Fall you. These part plays were always in verse and almost invariably the main theme was a combat between two heroes, the fall of one of them and his revival by a doctor. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Hmm. A typical performance recorded in Donabate, County Dublin in 15, 1952 runs thus. The action begins with the entry of a, a martial figure in a gay uniform with a, a beribboned soldier's hat, a sash and a sword. He speaks. Here I come, rim rhyme, give me room and give me time. For myself and many more, tired of the road and all foot sore. We fought our journey every inch, prepared to murder at a pinch. He who tries us to oppose, 
will split his skull and pinch his nose. If you don't believe what I have said, you may take it from me that you'll soon be dead. The one above all I'd hate to be is that white-wigged man from o'er the sea, the Sosnock who'll raise my gorge, so enter in, my brave Prince George. And Sosnock, of course, refers to the English. And I think Sosnock was, uh, in many places, a less a sort of a derogatory uh, terminology for the English, you know, a, 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 a not very friendly way of referring to them. Prince George enters. He, too, is gaily dressed. Here I come, a gallant prince, and for no mortal will I wince. Draw your sword and I'll draw mine. Draw your breath while I draw the line. Thus far, not another foot, or through your throat I'll blade this put. Sorry, <laughs> I got that totally mixed up, didn't I? Try that again, let's rewind. Thus far, and yet not another foot, or through your throat this blade I'll put. Deeds of valour, deeds of fame are associated with my name. Come who will his skill to try, take it from me, that man will die. England forever will Ireland enslave. I'll soon put our enemies into the grave. And of course, you can see here, absolutely, can't you, uh, the theme, uh, 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 you know, the historical theme of uh, 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 rivalry uh, between the Irish and the English. I presume the Prince George that's referred to was he who later became George III. So we're talking about 186, no, hang on. We're talking about 1760 to about 1820, something like that, aren't we? Uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, etc. Rim rhyme. Come on, you gallant boaster, till I give you a roaster. For good old Ireland's glory, I'll make you sore and gory. What brought you here at all, you clown? We never heard of your renown. Soon they'll hear in England dread that another of their sons is dead. They fight. Prince George falls. Prince George, send and get a doctor quick. You struck me not by skill, but trick. When he comes, if he can't cure, you'll be punished, you may be sure. Enter the doctor in tailcoat and top hat, carrying a large valise. Prince George, oh, doctor, doctor, cure me, dear, and richly I will meet your gear. What can you cure? Can you cure at all? Don't let me like a soldier fall. Doctor, taking bottles, knives, saws, etc. out of his bag. Cure I can for a noble fee. From your complaint I'll set you free. I can cure by day and night. I can diagnose by sight. The plague, it is no plague to me. Get it, kind sir, and I'll set you free. We could do with a little bit of that medicine right now, folks, couldn't we? Even the evil hoxy poxy I can alleviate by proxy. Let me apply my stethoscope, then I'll know if there is hope. Open your mouth, put out your tongue. Have you a pain in either lung? How is your bell, I mean your tummy, inclined to heave? Or rather, rummy. <laughs> I know the symptoms one and all. You just got shocked from a sudden fall. I attended a woman of 98 who fell off her bike and broke her pate. For her, it was a great disaster, but I cured her with my famous plaster. I have in the waistband of my breeches a cure for anything that itches. <laughs> Even he who's poor or rich is bound some time to get the itch. By, but by my cure, it has no match, but I'll guarantee that you won't scratch. So you cannot rise with a pain in your back. Come lend a hand. My good friend Slack. Next comes in a figure in tattered clothes. In one hand he carries a violin and in the other a griddle. Tied to his back are three effigies made of clothes stuffed with straw. One large and two small. He helps the doctor to set Prince George on his feet. Then he faces the audience and speaks. Here I come, poor slick Slack. My wife and family on my back. Five fingers on the fiddle and five more on the griddle. Brave I am, there is no doubt. Well known here and round about. Above board and on the level, I am the man that bet the devil. If you don't believe my drivel, enter in little divil. Enter little divil. He is dressed in black and his face is blackened. Here I come, little divil. Despite my name, you'll find me civil. Chewing tobacco and spitting quid. 
is the very worst thing I ever did. So up good people and give us a hand to put a good coffin on Jenny the Ran. Enter Joe the Butcher. He wears a striped apron and carries a carving knife and a steel. Joe the Butcher, here I come. The tricks of the trade are under my thumb. I can skin an old cow from her head to her heel with no other aid than my knife and steel. I'll scrape her and shape her the best way I can. So give us some coppers to bury the ram. Enter the wren, to whose clothes are sewn many turkey feathers. He speaks. The wren, the wren, the king of all birds. Since Stevens' day he was caught in the furs. She dipped her wing in a barrel of beer and wishes you all a happy new year. With Porter the price that it is today, it's going to be hard to pay our way. See, see that uh, the, the, the cost of living is based around the price of alcohol, not surprisingly in old Ireland. Add what you can to our little wealth, be it great or small, we'll drink your health. Whatever you give us goes into the pool. Now enter my friend, Tom Fool. Enter Tom Fool, dressed as a jester with bells on his cap. He carries a stick to which a bladder is tied by a length of string. With this, he strikes the other players as he speaks. Here I am, poor Tom the Fool. So I am called, for I hated school. The very best days of your life, they said. I many a time wished that I were dead. See me now with bladder and staff, doing my best to make you laugh. If I had learned what came my way, I wouldn't be here like this today. They say it's never too late to mend, but a seasoned stick you cannot bend. So ladies and gentlemen, sitting around the fire, give poor Tom his heart's desire, lest he into despairing sink. Give poor Tom the price of a drink. If you give silver and no brass, we'll up with the music and have a bit of gas. Here, Slick Slack strikes up a tune on his fiddle, joined by some of the others on other instruments. Some of the players dance and sing to entertain the audience. And Tom the Fool speaks a long verse composed for the occasion, with many topical and local allusions. The performance ends with the taking up of a collection by Little Divil. Those who perform the play are variously known as mummers, Christmas rhymers, or hogmanny men, and traditionally their performances are given during the 12 days of Christmas, although more recently groups have travelled about at any time between mid-December and the end of January. Most often the groups perform in the kitchens of living rooms of the houses they visit, but sometimes they appear in halls or barns lent for the occasion. These mummers' plays are remembered in tradition or have been recently performed in parts of these Irish counties, Antrim, Armagh, Cavan, Derry, Donegal, Down, Dublin, Fermanagh, Kilkenny, Leitrim, Louth, that's my own county, Mayo, Tyrone and Wexford. The characters vary from place to place. For instance, the fighting champions may be said to be St. Patrick and St. George, Prince George and the Turkey champion, or King James and King William, which is an interesting one. That's the Battle of the Boyne. Other known characters are Bonaparte, O'Connell, the Tsar of Russia, Beelzebub, Jack Straw, Big Head, Devil Doubt, Johnny Funny, and more recently, Hitler, Mussolini, and other topical figures. There is much variation in the verses, of which several versions are given in Alan Gailey's uh, Irish folk drama. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to do a, a mythical Ireland the musical says Kelly Edmiston <laughs> yes in a Wexford mummers play composed about the beginning of this century that's the 20th century because this is 1970s all the characters are from Irish history Colum Kill, Brian Boru, Art McMurrow Owen Roe O'Neill, Sarsfield Wolf Tone, Lord Edward Kelly of Killan, Michael Dwyer Robert Emmett and Father John Murphy all led by a captain who calls on each to speak his lines. F F Father John Murphy was the one uh, about whom, who features in the song Bula Vogue, isn't it? Um, the 1798 rebellion. Um, Bula Vogue as the sun was setting o'er 
through the bright bay meadows of Shelmalier. Um, yeah, and Father Murphy is mentioned at least once in that uh, song. Sorry for my terrible singing. <clears throat> Wexford mumming differs from all the others in that the highlight of the performance is an intricate sword dance. There are always 12 players, each with a wooden sword, and their dance is described by Patrick Kennedy in the banks of the borough. And thus, six men or boys stood in line at reasonable difference, distances apart, and six others stood opposite them, all armed as described. When the music began, feet and arms and sticks commenced to keep time. Each dancer, swaying his body to right and left, described an upright figure of eight with his fists, both of them following the same direction. The ends of the sticks forming the same figure, of course. In these movements, no noise was made, but at certain bars, the arms moved up and down, the upper and lower halves of the right hand stick striking the lower half of the left hand stick in the descent of the right arm and the upper half of it in the ascent and vice versa. Sounds a tiny, am I mistaken or does it sound a tiny bit like Morris dancing? At the proper point of the march, each man commenced a kind of fencing with his vis-a-vis -vis, and the clangs of cudgels coincided with the beats of the music and the movements of the feet. Then commenced the modulations, evolutions, interlacings and unwindings, everyone striking at the person with whom the movements brought him face to face and the sounds of the sticks supplying the hooking in reels. It was a stirring but apparently confused spectacle, which, when the music was good and the dancing combatants kept time, strongly interested and excited the lookers-on. Formerly in County Wexford, there was also comical couple Darby and Joan, the latter a young man disguised as an old woman. This pair took no part in the dance and had no set verses to say, but they kept the spectators amused by jokes and pranks during the performance. In recent years, there has been a revival of mumming in some areas, notably in South County Wexford, where competitions between groups are held annually. Wexford groups have performed in Dublin and elsewhere, as well as on television, and have travelled abroad to international folk festivals. Some years ago, a group of artillerymen from Kildare Barracks were organised and training in the Wexford-style mumming by a sergeant from that county, name, named St Barbara's Mummers, after the Gunners patron saint, they gave performances to raise money for charity. Similarly, busmen in Ballyclare County Antrim raised money for charity in a like manner. What the origins of mumming and the mummers plays may be, we do not know. It is clear that most of the verses and action of Irish traditional mumming are so closely related to that of England that the custom must be ascribed to English influence. How early this may have been, and that goes back to Brendan's point about perhaps existing outside the pale, this might contradict that and suggest otherwise. How early this may have been is difficult to say. Hanmer's Chronicle, describing King Henry's celebration of Christmas in Dublin in 1172, tells of, quote, the pastime, the sport and the mirth of the continual music, the masking, mumming and strange shoes S-H-E-U-E-S -E -E the gold, the silver and plate the precious ornaments, the dainty dishes, unquote. Christmas plays were popular in the medieval towns. For instance in Dublin in 1458 a different play was presented on each day of Christmas week on a stage erected on Hoggan Green before the Lord Deputy and the Lord Mayor and Bailiffs. The Carpenters Guild showed a nativity play the shoemakers told the story of St. Crispin, their patron. The tailors portrayed Adam and Eve. Others presented more secular themes. The vintners showed Bacchus, the bakers, Ceres, and the blacksmiths, Vulcan. In addition, and to restore the religious air proper to the season, the leaders of the clergy had the Passion of Our Lord and the martyrdoms of the apostles performed. And there we go, a fascinating insight into... Um, you know, some of the ancient rituals pertaining to uh, St. Stephen's Day, the uh, the haunting of the wren and the mummers. Uh, very briefly, uh, let me just a, a quick 
search on the, in, the internet. Um, do, 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 yes. Just uh, let me see. Uh, I just want to see if there's any Hunting the Rain stories from Drogheda or from my uh, local area here. Let me let, let me let me let me narrow that search down by putting Drogheda into it because if I just do Hunting the Rain, I got loads of results. Uh, or Rain Boys Drogheda. None, no mentions. Interesting. So that's on duchas.ie, the school's folklore collection online. Apparently Stephen is a very scarce name, according to one writer here. Um, and there's a suggestion here. There was an old custom of hunting the wren on St. Stephen's Day and killing the wren with stones as St. Stephen was stoned to death. A possible tie-in with... Uh, Stephen was the first Christian martyr, wasn't he? Was he not the one who was crucified upside down? Uh, forgive me if I'm mistaken. Since ancient days, the old customs of hunting the wren is carried out in near, nearly every part of Ireland on St. Stephen's Day. From early in the morning until dusk, it is pleasant to see the wren boys, big and small, big and small ones, some with face masks in them. Not that kind of face mask. And others having their faces blackened with soot, going from house to house with a bramble of a holly tree decorated with coloured papers and ribbons on their shoulders. And singing the following rhyme, the wren, the wren, the king. Okay, continued on next page. How do we go to the next page? The king of all birds. St. Stephen's Day, he was caught by the furs. I pray you, good lady, give us a treat. My box would speak if it had but a tongue. A penny or two will do, if not wrong. Sing holly, sing ivy, sing ivy, ivy, sing holly. Yeah, the variant on the previous day sang verses or spoken verses. A throw just a drink will drown melancholy. If you draw it of the best, I hope in heaven your soul may rest. But if you draw of the small, it won't agree with the Wren boys at all. When this rhyme would be finished, someone in the house would give them a few pence. And again, one is also reminded of Halloween customs when you went round the houses. When we were kids, we didn't say trick or treat. We actually had to sing a song or recite a poem or do perform some kind of act before we were uh, treated to... to uh, money or fruit or sweets or apples or whatever it happened to be. Bird lore. Of all the small birds, the wren lays the greatest number of eggs. And if the eggs are taken away, all but one, the wren will keep on laying until it dies. In bygone days, the wren was a hated bird. There's a certain day set aside every winter for hunting the wren, but like all other birds, it was left in peace. I don't understand that at all. Uh, I'm corrected. Uh, St. Peter asked to be cruci crucified with the cross upside down because he did not think he was worthy of dying, as Jesus had said, says Maureen. Um, Just making sure I'm not missing anybody on Mark Rhodes Taylor is on YouTube. If you like mumming, wassailing is also fun. Here we come, a wassailing. Isn't that a, a Christmas carol? Uh, Mark also adds, I love Mythical Ireland. I'm making my way through all of our Anthony's videos. You're going to have, uh, I hope you have plenty of time in your hands. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you all for joining us on this unscheduled um, uh, episode of Live Irish Myths. I just felt, you know, with Morgan coming on on Monday, it would be too late next week to be talking about St. Stephen's Day customs. Best uh, to talk about them on the day uh, that it happens. If you're interested, um, we'll do. We'll be doing another episode of Book Talk also next week. Uh, if you didn't see the post on Facebook, uh, one of my Christmas gifts was. Uh, 32 Words for Field by Moncon McGann. Now, I haven't read it uh, yet, 
I have dipped into it and immediately found something really astonishingly fascinating. So I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to reading that. Uh, I have, uh, have had several recommendations on the Mythical Ireland community about this book over the last month or so. So definitely looking forward to getting stuck into that one. Actually, the reading I've been doing fascinating and there's going to be a blog post uh, on this uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. I've been going back over this and really finding it full of treasure. And that is the very famous uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. And the reason I've been going back over it is because I didn't, when I had read it before, I, I, I didn't really try, I suppose, to make the connections uh, with Irish mythology. And there are some very, very important connections in there. Uh, so that's going to make uh, a blog post, I think, first and foremost, which will probably become at some point an episode of Live Irish Myths or Book Talk, <laughs> one or the other. But that's uh, Joseph Campbell. I think that's the book he's most famous for. <laughs> I do apologize. That's the turkey and stuffing now. I'll have to get something to help wash that down. What do you recommend? We do the old. Um... <laughs> anyway, happy Christmas, everybody. Happy St. Stephen's Day. We'll see you hopefully all going well in two evenings time. That's Monday evening. Don't forget episode, which is now episode 132, will be the uh, wonderfully prolific writer Morgan Daimler who will be talking to her, us about her uh, translation into English of Kot Moitura, uh, the second battle of Moitura. Perhaps the, the first and only scholar to have translated the entire work. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. By the way, if you have any questions for Morgan, then don't forget uh, to keep a note of them uh, for that episode uh, because we look forward to uh, we look forward to, you know, um, well, first of all, we look forward to her presence, uh, but we look forward to having a little sort of interaction between yourselves and her. Um, so uh, the main thing is to, to continue to enjoy yourselves, have a peaceful, happy, safe Christmas. Uh, the COVID-19 case numbers in Ireland over the past week have well and truly skyrocketed um, in an astonishing way. And we're assuming that the vector of uh, that increase is caused by the fact that we have the new, more virulent strain from the UK, which has been detected in Ireland. Today, we had 1,296 cases. A few days ago, we had 700. Um, we had six further deaths today, unfortunately. So um, we're uh, heading into uh, uh, level five, um, well, a sort of a variant of level five uh, lockdown now which means you know um, we're going to we're going to have another period now of lockdown unfortunately but anyway we'll do what we can uh, mainly to keep ourselves safe uh, and of course in doing so in keeping everyone else safe as well and that will involve all sorts of things from washing hands regularly and uh, using the hand sanitizer I have a bottle here in the library uh, to cough and sneeze etiquette into the crook of your arm or the back of your elbow, whatever you want to call it, social distancing and uh, not making unnecessary trips, especially with there are going to be other people. And if you are among other people wearing a mask, let's get through this together, says Valerie. Absolutely. 100%. Uh, so don't forget to look up the special offer on the website. And if you haven't got one before now, get your Mythical Ireland calendar. I still have calendars and uh, we'll still continue to send them out uh, as long as I have them in stock. In the meantime, we'll see you on Monday for Live Irish Mints, unless, of course, I get the opportunity to do an impromptu uh, broadcast outside, uh, which we won't promise, but you never know. We'll see uh, how many we can uh, uh, and what we can facilitate. Take it easy anyway. Uh, uh, the usual uh, nightly greetings. Uh, good night. Kolosov, sound sleep. Slán gafol. Bye for now. And the most important one of all, Togaboogie. Take it easy. <laughs>